Welcome back. In a moment, we'll be talking about China's economy. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. A surprise parliamentary vote has seen the sale, production and importing of alcohol banned across Iraq. The vote is being described as unconstitutional by many politicians. Doctors in the UK have drawn up a list of 40 common treatments that they say bring little or no benefit to patients. The list includes the use of plaster casts for small fractures, prescribing chemotherapy in cases of terminal cancer, and routinely screening for prostate conditions. It's hoped it will reduce the number of unnecessary medical treatments. A bus crash in California has left more than 10 dead and 31 injured. Photographs from the crash site, which is located near the city of Palm Springs, show the tour bus wedged into the back of a tractor. Next, we have the second of Tai Genwright's reports on China. After leapfrogging Japan to become the world's second most valuable economy, China was on track to surpass the United States as the world's largest within a generation. But there's been a sharp reversal over the past 12 months, which has raised questions about whether China's economic growth model is sustainable. It's not long since the financial world was gripped by a Chinese market meltdown. After a generation of truly phenomenal reinvention, China's juggernaut economy got slower. Growth remains above 6%, and while that would be very healthy in most economies, in China, where so much more development is needed, it's the difference between sustainability and decline. China is increasingly a systemic country. It has huge spillovers to the uh, world economy through trade, through commodity prices. So how it does is, is very important to uh, the path of, of global growth. Just as the Chinese economy starts to falter, Beijing has been spreading its international financial influence. After relaxing controls and the value of its currency, the renminbi is now included in a group of major world currencies that make up the reserves of the International Monetary Fund. The continuation and deepening of these efforts with appropriate safeguards will bring about a more robust international monetary and financial system, which in turn will be good for the stability and growth of China and of the international economy. And Chinese money has been buying up foreign assets at a growing rate, whether it's investing in British nuclear power or ports and other infrastructure in Greece. The theory is that Chinese companies want to diversify their interests away from their domestic market. And by helping with development aid in poorer countries, the Chinese state wants to buy influence and earn diplomatic soft power. But China has a debt problem. It borrowed a lot for a future that now looks less certain. The new city of Ordos is often referred to as a ghost town because so few people have gone to live there. The markets are calmer now, but the Chinese economy is not out of the woods. Exports in September were a dramatic 10% lower than the year before, and the Chinese currency hit a six-year low against the US dollar. There is now a new breed of Chinese super-rich, and China's rapidly rising prosperity was the tide that lifted all the world's boats during the financial crisis. Now the rest of us might have to learn to swim by ourselves. Ty Genwright, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Linda Yu, who is a fellow in economics at the University of Oxford. Also with us is Ginny Yan from the Chief China Economist at the ICBC Standard Bank. Uh, Linda, this huge amount of infrastructure spending which the Chinese government has done, will that be enough to turn the economy around, do you think? I think it'll help stymie some of the slowdown in the Chinese economy, but it's not going to reverse it because China's essentially entered a stage where it's already middle income. And as countries grow richer, the growth rate slows. Um, however, the worry about China is that it's not just any country. It is a transition economy dominated by the communist state. So the process of 
its economic change looks quite shaky in some respects, especially in terms of debt. And that's why the government has put in this massive stimulus investment program over the next three years, trying to boost growth while they work out the reforms needed to the institutions to get market uh, going in China, while at the same time preserving uh, the power of the government. And I think that's why we shouldn't expect that it'll change the course of uh, the Chinese economy, but it will certainly help I think cushion some of that slowdown. Judy, does it need a more mixed economy? Needs another trick or two up its sleeve? <laughs> well, I think uh, what we've seen in the recent months certainly is this continued going back of the traditional growth model, effectively relying on credit, relying on the housing market. Yes, it needs to find new drivers of growth. The thing is, it's actually happening. It's just that we don't have the data really, you know, and official data, of course, doesn't track it as well as the traditional sort of drivers of the, of the economy. Explain a bit about the housing market, because that has changed, and they've had to introduce reforms now. What, to stop people, to stop the sort of housing um, escalation in prices and so on? Yes, well, um, in terms of affordability, it's always been an issue. But the housing market bubble, the cycle that we've seen is getting shorter and shorter. So effectively, we have um, a period whereby the housing uh, market speculation in certain cities are driven up, particularly by land prices. The fundamental problem really in China is about land and really a, a sort of sustainable source of revenue for local governments. If that problem is not solved, the housing bubble, the housing market issue is continually going, going to exist in China. And can that trickle that sort of city effect and the, what, half a dozen or so real centres where this phenomenal growth has been, has been focused, can that trickle out, if you like, to the rest of China? I think it can. So if you look at the very uneven distribution of GDP, national output in China, you get a very strong sense that a lot of it is centered in urban centers on the mm. coast. So something like three quarters of Chinese national output GDP is on the Gold Coast. So that means cities like Shanghai, cities like Guangzhou, cities like Tianjin and Beijing have a huge amount of influence on the rest of the economy. That's why the Chinese government has clamped down on house prices, but they can't clamp down too hard. Because because in an economy that doesn't have a lot of options for its people to save, people either put their money in housing or they put it in the stock market. And as you know, Martin, the stock market has also had its problems. <laughs> and so it's I think it's, yes, it's a real balancing act. What they really need to do um, is to allow capital to go overseas, invest mm. for ordinary people to invest overseas. But of course, that's part of the intricate reforms that they need to do. We've heard a bit about the, obviously, the Chinese government investing overseas. And here in the UK, we've heard of projects that may or may not go ahead on that scale. But if I'm a, um, a middle-class Chinese person with a reasonable income and I've got some savings, am I not allowed to invest overseas at, at the moment? You can't invest a great deal overseas, so there's a cap on it. And actually, for the ordinary Chinese, it's really about access. It's not even really about uh, the amount. It's about the fact that they may live in a more rural part, uh, which doesn't have uh, financial products, which are easily understandable, available. And that's a product of the fact that the Chinese financial system is dominated on the banking side by state-owned banks. Mm. And I think that's the real part of the deep reforms that they do need. Some in order to give people some liberalization options, needs there, yeah. opening up to competition. But that is coming against state ownership, and that's probably the hardest reform in China. Yes, state two owned immovable state owned forces coming together there. What about the currency? Um, because that's been a problem, hasn't it, in terms of the dollar's been rising so much of late, of this last year, running away, and everyone's felt the effects, including the Chinese economy. Absolutely. I would always say the three major problems are actually um, the three Ds in China. So you've got debt situation, which you talked about in your video earlier, depreciation, um, not just depreciation it's itself, but the expectation of further depreciation. That's really what's driving foreign investors out of China. Um, the fact that we had this one-way um, appreciation of the currency, that period has ended. We've seen much more two-way volatility of the currency, so that uncertainty about where the currency is going is really driving foreign investors away. And then thirdly, which I think most people actually underestimate in China at the moment, is the demographic shift happening in China. 
not just in terms of the aging population, but also in terms of how the labour force is really um, going to, uh, you know, going to evolve in terms of whether there's going to be a labour mismatch. Do we have the right labour force to go up the value curve for China? We do have layoffs, for example, in overcapacity industries, etc. Are these people the right sort of labour that will drive China? That's interesting. New drivers. It's the world's most populous place, isn't it? You should have plenty of labour to choose from. Is it the skills are not right or the number of skills in the right sectors is not right? Uh, that's part of it, and part of it is the well, almost well-known now um, aging story because of the one-child policy, which they're trying to reverse. So yeah. China is really unusual in being a middle-income country, which sees its working-age population at the moment shrinking for the past three years. That's highly unusual, yeah. and that means there is a danger that uh, China's working age uh, population is reflecting something deeper about the way the population has been controlled. It raises issues about how you support the elderly. China's not going to run out of workers, but what do you do with an aging population and a slowing economy? And I think that's one of the big issues. But the other big issue is actually, um, can China's slowdown still provide enough jobs so that you have graduates, 10 million graduates a year, who get good jobs. Do they have the right skills? Yeah. What about the uh, elderly who are more used to a state-dominated system? And I think all of those things are slowing down Chinese reforms as the Chinese policymakers don't want to get rid of the state-owned drivers that provide those jobs and livelihoods because they worry ultimately about instability. So any type of growth plan they always have in the back of their mind, will it keep social stability? And that's one of the reasons why reforms actually at the moment are a bit slow on some of these fronts. And on the strategic pictures, Ginny, what do you think about um, Chinese investment in, well, the continent of Africa, for instance? It's, it's been remarkable, hasn't it? Is there more to it than just trying to make a buck? Well, to be honest, I think it's more than historically. Obviously, China and Africa have been friends, um, and uh, not just from a sort of just money perspective, but also from a political perspective. Uh, I think China does need more um, uh, friends, effectively, in the international arena. I think Africa has always been a friend to China, but in the longer term, I think China may sees Africa as the sort of testing ground for the first batch of sort of outgoing capital. The biggest transformation, one of the biggest, is for China to become a net exporter of capital. And the first places it did that was in Africa. Now it's more about just the resource focused type of investment. It's also about companies, you know, doing uh, mergers and acquisitions. Now that uh, Chinese corporates are becoming more and more experienced, they're now venturing into developed markets. And of course, the One Belt, One Road strategy means that 60 countries across Eurasia are also seeing similar patterns to what China has been doing in Africa. Ginny Yan, Linda Yu, thank you both very much. Thank you. Now we end with our Insight Bite, a little something that we feel you should know. Thousands of people in Russia have braved the winter cold and turned out to witness a reenactment of a great battle from the Napoleonic Wars. The event commemorates a turning point in the conflict which took place in 1812 when Russian soldiers attacked a retreating French army. The invading French troops, having just evacuated Moscow, were confronted while heading to southern Russia to make camp for the winter. More than 12,000 soldiers died during several days of fighting. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Inside.